To our Valentine, Joe Zone, you're the best because you beat the rest. Can't wait to see you're all behind you. You're the best of sports of all sorts. Be our Valentine. <laughs> Folks, it's not funny. Write a funny Valentine and get set to win. We had a winner today, $176. Great rough and tough movie tomorrow. Meet me back here at the movies and have a good one. Good evening, I'm Nolan Johannes. And I'm Karen Hart. Tonight in the news, Scranton's Bishop O'Connor moves to the Big Apple. We'll speak live with him from Scranton. Scranton's Bishop won't only be missed by the Catholics in northeastern Pennsylvania. I'm Kathy Belich. I'll have that story. More water tests and more problems for PG&W. I'm Mark Davis. Those stories plus Tom Clark's weather and Joe's own on sports. All this next on Newswatch 16. Proud to serve Northeastern and Central Pennsylvania. This is WNEP 16, the news station. Now, Nolan Johannes, Karen Hart, Pilot Jack Rulin in Skycam 16, Chief Meteorologist Tom Clark, and Joe Zone on sports. This is News Watch 16. Good evening, I'm Karen Hart. And I'm Nolan Johannes. Bishop John J. O'Connor celebrated the 8 o'clock daily mass as usual today in St. Peter's Cathedral in downtown Scranton. But today was definitely different. The spiritual leader of Northeast Pennsylvania's almost 350,000 Roman Catholics officially announced he is leaving this area. In a news conference following the mass, Bishop O'Connor said that after only seven months as Bishop of the Scranton Diocese, Pope John Paul II is appointing him to head the almost two million Catholics in what is called the influential Archdiocese of New York. Bishop O'Connor succeeds Terence Cardinal Cook, who died almost four months ago. Bishop O'Connor learned of his pending appointment two weeks ago from the Apostolic Delegate to Washington, D.C. Bishop O'Connor is live with us now in Scranton. First of all, sir, congratulations, and sit back and relax a bit. I know it's been a hectic day. In fact, the past two weeks have probably been the longest you've ever had. It's been a very long two weeks. I appreciate your congratulations and uh, the invitation to relax. I'm thoroughly relaxed. Thank you. Okay, good. Feel at home. Now, first of all, you're going to the Big Apple. That's the big leagues compared to Scranton. How do you feel about that? Are you afraid at all? Oh, now, wait a minute. Scranton <laughs> is a magnificent place, and uh, there are no better people any place in the world. But I must admit that uh, playing with the Yankees is a little bit different. Uh, am I afraid of them? Yes. I'm scared to death. <laughs> bishop O'Connor, you were auxiliary bishop uh, under uh, uh, Cardinal Cook. You were there for four years. I understand you also were named as the bishop or were serving as the bishop of the New York State Catholic Conference. Did all of these roles that you play and your familiarity with New York and that archdiocese have anything to do, do you think, with your appointment? Gee, these things are really, and I'm not trying to be evasive, uh, very mysterious. Uh, the Holy Father had some 350 bishops in the United States to select from and uh, many, many thousands of priests and the reasons for the selection are uh, obviously very complex and beyond my understanding, but uh, I would think, wouldn't you, that if you were looking for someone for as complicated a, uh, and as enormous a uh, city and a diocese as New York that uh, you would think it helpful to get someone who had at least been exposed to it for a few years. <laughs> now, I know that Auxiliary Bishop Timlin has um, been suggested as a replacement for you here in the Scranton area. I know the Pope has to make the final recommendation, but um, does it look like Auxiliary Bishop Timlin will be the one? Again, it's awfully difficult to uh, predict that. I don't think that a finer choice could be made. Uh, I would certainly support it, enthusiastically recommend it, and uh, would be just personally delighted if that happened. Bishop O'Connor, as you leave, you're going to leave in March. Uh, could you tell the people living here in Northeast Pennsylvania what you will be carrying with you as the uniqueness, what you will remember about the Scranton Diocese? Yeah, I'll be leaving first off with a great deal of pain, and I say that very sincerely. My, my initial reaction when I learned that I would be leaving was one of uh, just an almost uh, overwhelming grief I'll take with me most particularly the, uh, the warmth, the sheer goodness of these people here. I've lived pretty much throughout the world, and I have never encountered a better people than I have come to know here. I've 
fallen in love with them in a brief period of seven months, and uh, I hope that uh, they'll miss me. Bishop O'Connor, we will be talking to you again tonight. We thank you for your interview just now. We'll see you again on the update tonight at 11. My privilege. And of thank course, you. You'll be sticking around for Nightline for a live interview, too, so we'll be looking forward right. to that. Thank, thank you. you. See you later. There's also reaction today from non Catholic church leaders. Newswatch 16's Kathy Bellich asked some of them about the bishop's efforts to build a bridge between all the area churches and synagogues, and if that bridge will remain with Bishop O'Connor leaving. From the time Bishop John O'Connor first said Mass here at St. Peter's Cathedral in Scranton, one of his big priorities has been to get the people of all faiths to work together on goals they were trying to achieve separately. But will things change once the bishop is gone? He thinks not. Well, I think the first thing that uh, we can say is that uh, the mayor will continue to pick up the trash. We don't have to <laughs> bishop Timlin here, who is our vicar general, has been in on everything whatsoever that I've done. I've made no major move without consulting him. I rarely even change my socks without uh, asking him about it. But leaders in the other religious faiths have mixed thoughts about that. Rabbi Simon Shoup of Temple Israel in Scranton says the bishop's boundless energies have inspired him and others. He certainly has sparked a great deal of enthusiasm for ecumenism within our community. And I feel that uh, even though he won't be with us, the good that he has done will continue. Reverend William Leedy of the Covenant Presbyterian Church in Scranton says the future hinges largely on O'Connor's successor. Seven or nine or 12 months is a very short time, uh, barely the twinkling of an eye. Someone will take his job. No one will take his place. Rabbi Shoup may have said something that sums up the feelings of many. He says the honor people here in northeastern Pennsylvania bestowed upon Bishop O'Connor can in no way match the honor Bishop O'Connor bestowed upon northeastern Pennsylvania by being here. Kathy Bellich, Newswatch 16, Scranton. Newswatch 16 continues with the latest push and shove between Scranton and the men who work for the DPW. Dialing for dollars gets rough and tough all this week. More labor leaders are getting involved in the DPW feud in Scranton. As we've been telling you, the city's road crews have been on strike now for a week and a half. Newswatch 16's Bob Constantini is live now in our Scranton newsroom with the latest on this dispute. Bob? Karen, Newswatch 16 has learned exclusively that negotiations have been going on between city and union leaders, union lawyers, that is, and sources tell us those talks may be leading to an agreement as early as tonight. We've just learned that city solicitor Ed Skakiti and attorney Tom Jennings, who represents the International Association of Machinists, met most of this afternoon at the Hilton Hotel. The meetings broke up a little less than an hour ago, with Jennings reportedly taking a progress report back to the Department of Public Works union leaders. We're told if an agreement is reached tonight, a news conference will be called with the two lawyers, and it will be held sometime tonight. Talks between the regular bargaining units did not resume today, and in an afternoon news conference, representatives from the Scranton Central Labor Council, Teamsters, electrical workers, garment workers, and other unions voiced their support for the striking DPW workers. Meetings between the two sides. Attorneys will continue tonight if needed, but we repeat there are reliable reports that a settlement is near in the two-week-old Scranton DPW strike. Bob Constantini, live in the Scranton newsroom. Karen, Nolan? Thank you, Bob. Pennsylvania Gas and Water Company continued some valve testing today to see if it's possible to convert a large part of the Giardiasis area to a different water source other than the contaminated Springbrook Reservoir. Newswatch 16's Mark Davis reports that testing brought some unexpected problems. Shelley Bassano of Luzerne didn't expect any water problems because Luzerne was not on the list of towns that might get dirty water because of PG&W testing. But after doing some wash, Sally was surprised and angry. Her water had turned her wash a dirty brown. I don't have a towel left in the house except the ones I have hanging in the bathroom for decoration. And I mean, what am I going to do now? I'll have to go and buy all new towels. In Kingston, where dirty water was expected, this meatpacking plant was shut down before noon because water filters clogged and cut off the water pressure. Randy Malou manages the plant. He never expected it to be this bad. 
the uncertainty is the hard part. It's it, not quite so bad if we would know a little bit more, but not knowing and being right in the middle of a production day and, and finding you have no water coming in suddenly is really the hardship. PG&W says the problems in Luzerne were unexpected. The severity of the problem in Kingston may not even be related to the testing, but the utility says it is learning as it goes along. We will we'll learn experientially as we go along. Uh, it's, it's a new process for us in, in trying to serve this entire area from other sources of supply. Pennsylvania Gas and Water Company says no more tests are planned, therefore no new water problems are expected. Now it's time to look at the test results and see how the new water system is working. Mark Davis, Newswatch 16, Wilkesbury. And our meteorologist Tom Clark is next. Tom, winter is back in our area. Boy, it sure is. More very cold air coming to town tonight, Karen and Nolan, and when we come back, we'll find out how long it's going to stay. We'll be right back. The outrageous boy George. Tonight it's seven. Hey, it's time to go outside to the chilly backyard or meteorologist Tom Clark. How are you holding up out there, Tom? Karen, so far so good. Uh, kind of cold out here tonight. A fresh batch of cold air has come in. The snow we had last night uh, goes into the books as measuring 2.2 inches. And I missed it by only 8 tenths of an inch. Now, surrounding mountains got anywhere from 4 to 6 inches of snow as predicted. Let me show you the temperature now. We have partly cloudy skies overhead and on the old thermometer it stands at 23. That's pretty cold. The humidity is 60 percent. A little bit of wind chill in the air. That wind coming in from the northwest and uh, because the atmosphere is getting colder the barometer is rising. The high today in this backyard was 29. Well that's since 7 o'clock this morning and that was last night's low but the low so far today is the current temperature. That uh, normal low of 17 is the lowest it gets in the winter time. And that record high was set uh, back in 1916. The horse in the background must be saying, why me? Now take a look at the satellite view. It's from deep in outer space. Look at these clouds up here over Maine. That's the big storm that missed us last night. Uh, put down upwards to 6 to 12 inches of snow in parts of Maine. And up there in Portland, Maine, they now have 32 inches of snow on the ground. They got about a half foot from the storm. But that's the storm that's hauling down the cold air into the state now. Uh, just some patchy clouds to the west. We'll see a little sun tomorrow. Jet stream winds continue from western Canada. But it was 62 this afternoon at Rapid City, South Dakota. And some of this mild air is going to be steered in our direction for later on this week. Now the warmest place in the country today that I could find was down in Palm Springs, California. 81 degrees. Here's our forecast for tonight. It looks like this. A cold breeze out there and uh, just a few snow flurries over the mountain areas. Look at that Troy in Bradford County. Eight above for the low tonight. Carbondale will bottom out at about 10, uh, 10 degrees tomorrow morning. 12 in Nanticoke, about uh, 13 in Sailorsburg. That's down there in Monroe County. And out in Milton, the low tonight about uh, 12 degrees. So a cold night on the way for tonight for sure. Tomorrow there will be some sunshine, quite a bit in the morning, and then skies may look a little cloudy at times during the afternoon, but the day will stay dry, and the high in New Milford, 25 degrees. How about Brown Town, section of Pittston Township? Hello out there, your high tomorrow about 28. 27 in Jim Thorpe, 28 in Sunbury, and in Williamsport, a southwest wind late in the day at about 12 miles per hour. Now the sunshine tomorrow uh, near normal temperatures, I may improve your mood somewhat. The reflexes, well, that looks pretty high for tomorrow. Resistance to aches and pains average, so no big problems there. Cold tonight, the low will be 12 degrees, partly sunny tomorrow, 28. The warmer air begins working back in Thursday and Friday. Thursday, Groundhog Day, and I suspect there'll be some sunshine in the morning for Puxatawney Phil to see his shadow, and that means six more weeks of cold winter weather, 45 on Friday. You know the old Groundhog legend began back in the 1880s? Oh, my goodness. And you were there, right, Tom? <laughs> I was, I, yeah. I saw my shadow, too. Yeah, well, I sure. shouldn't even have said that because I think I'd be liable for the next comment. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Tom. Coming up next on Newswatch 16, Joe Zone is back from North Carolina. I wonder if he has a draw. Yeah, well, we'll find <laughs> out. Joe begins his look at a local athlete who is part of the number one basketball team.
I'm Dave Letiri from Scranton. I started my training in Northeastern Pennsylvania seven years ago. And today I'm at Scranton's Nayog Park where I had my first bike race. And now I'm training for the 1984 Olympics. It take a lot of hard work and dedication to get to the Olympic Games, and we need your support. So please, send your contribution to the United States Olympic Committee. And who knows, maybe you'll see me in Los Angeles next year. A public service of WNEP-TV 16. Well, Tim kept the secret through Friday, but we found out over the weekend Joe was in North Carolina. How was it down there, Joe? It's college basketball heaven. If you like college basketball, that's the place to go. Mm -hmm. It was warm. Well, let's with... go. Uh, okay, <laughs> we're on. <laughs> it was warm. <laughs> Let me tell you while I was there, and there's no doubt about it, it is a place where college basketball reigns supreme. And why not? Take a look at the new college basketball rankings for this week. North Carolina remains undefeated as the top-ranked team in the country. Both polls, DePaul, Kentucky, Georgetown, Nevada, Las Vegas in there. But North Carolina is still number one. And you know what? Through the entire top 20, four teams from the Atlantic Coast Conference are ranked. So it gives you a good idea of what the college basketball like is in that part of the country. Now, as I mentioned, I had a chance to watch the Tar Heels play over the weekend, but more specifically, I had a chance to see Bishop O'Reilly graduate Dave Popson, who's a freshman with North Carolina. The most sought-after player ever to come out of this area has seen little playing time with the Tar Heels so far, but according to head coach Dean Smith, that is just temporary. We purposely did not recruit anybody in the size category of uh, anybody six, six and up this year because we were very happy with David Popson and Joe Wolf. So I don't want to over recruit for one position. So uh, we obviously have big plans for him. Tomorrow night, we'll talk about those plans. We'll begin a three part series on Popson and his first three months with top rank North Carolina. Last week, I responded to a frustrated fan about our coverage of girls' basketball. I, po I pointed out honestly that with my time limitations, they just forced me to cover sports and events which draw the most interest. Well, my comments brought in an awful lot of mail the past week. Here's some of it. Bravo, Mr. Zone, a Wilkes-Barre woman writes. There certainly is not sufficient fan support to justify more coverage. And we can hardly expect an insignificant sportscaster on an insignificant station to try and right the wrongs that have gone on for centuries and that have made women's sports an undervalued, underprivileged, underviewed part of high school and college athletics. We can only expect people like you and organizations like WNEP to perpetuate the myopic, male-oriented coverage of these sports. Signed, Julianne Elliott of Wilkes-Barre. Now, another viewer wrote regarding your statement that only 30 to 40 people, all relatives to the players, are the only fans in attendance at most games. I must question when the last time was that you personally viewed girls' games. I can guess that it was 30 to 40 years ago if you ever attended a game at all. That letter came from a former high school and collegiate female player who forgot to sign her name. For the record, and believe me, I am not comfortable debating this issue back and forth on the air, but for the record, I was at a girls game, in fact, last Tuesday night, saw the 11th ranked women's team in the country play. 50 other people also saw the nationally ranked Lady Royals play that night. Perhaps someone more significant than I will take on the challenge of promoting girls basketball. I agree, the girls deserve the coverage. We give them what we can, but it is neither my duty nor my obligation to promote something that you don't even support. Look around or in the mirror and then ask who's really letting these girls down. Right, All the And I'll try to fit in those girls' scores too, if the time permits. Okay, right. we'll We're look gonna forward to hold you to that too. Thank you, Joseph. News Watch 16 continues with Steamtown on the Move. That's right. We're going to have the latest chapter of the move from Iron and Steel into Scranton. Stay tuned. This is the moment. Brides, don't forget to register for WNEP's Big Bridal Fair. Time's running out for the most extravagant bridal fair around. Time for Bridal Fair. Register for your free invitation at Wyoming Homes or Gus Gennetti's Best Western Motor Inn. 
finally tonight, what we've all been waiting for is here. The first locomotive and passenger train from the Steamtown Rail Museum in Vermont has rolled into Scranton. The old-time trains were towed to the city by a modern diesel train. The locomotive was expected to arrive in Scranton earlier this afternoon, but the excursion met with a few delays along the way. Once the whole Steeptown USA exhibit is moved to its new home, city officials hope it will attract more tourists here. Now that exciting. is exciting. I remember those steam engines when I was a little guy. Geez, I don't. Yeah, well, they did. They went right by my house. I loved it. <laughs> okay, that's our report for now. Be sure to join us tonight on the update at 11 when we'll take a look at the liquor store business, both private and state operated, plus more on the Bishop and the latest on Scranton DPW strike. For the team, thanks for being with us and enjoy your evening.